So without further ado, um, leaving uh, the Earth is uh, very challenging. So we need uh, powerful rockets that are made mostly of fuel to launch relatively small amounts of useful material to space, like spacecrafts, satellites, landers, rovers, and all their systems and instruments. And because of that, the cost of spaceflight is quite high. Um, but we do see a, a paradigm shift today uh, with, with the current uh, trend to use reusable rockets, boosters, and perhaps even uh, open stage rockets. Um, that indeed lowers costs. Um, but regardless of how powerful a rocket is and how efficient its engines are and uh, how elaborate its staging is, we will always reach uh, a glass ceiling uh, due to the rocket equation. So we have this tyranny of this rocket equation. We need exponentially bigger rockets to go faster and to launch more payload. Um, and the only way that we know of uh, to flatten that curve is orbital refueling. Um, and only recently um, the space industry became so mature uh, that it actually created a market for that. Um, with thousands of satellites that are currently orbiting the Earth, telecommunications, Earth observation, internet satellites, and even tens of thousands more to come uh, in the upcoming years, uh, we have this massive client base that might want to refuel these spacecrafts. Uh, because the thing you need to know about the satellites is that they are quite resilient to the space environment. They are designed in a way that that's quite resilient to the space environment, especially those larger satellites. Um, uh, and um, they could have a lifetime of tens of years and they are still operating. Uh, but the limiting factor in, in, in their lifetime is their fuel. Um, they, need, um, they need the fuel to counter the atmospheric drag if they're in low Earth orbit, um, and also mitigate the increasingly um, um, more frequent uh, potential collisions by performing maneuvers. Uh, and also at the same time, that's actually the, the good thing about the times that we live in, in 2009, uh, we confirmed that water ice exists on the moon. Um, so as long as the cost of extraction, processing and transportation of the lunar propellant to Earth orbit um, is lower than transportation of this propellant uh, from Earth to Leo, uh, we have this commercial business case. And even if that would be higher than that, we still have strategic uh, business case uh, that we can build up uh, different businesses and induce business potential. But so far as we look at it, uh, we do have this commercial business case for lunar water. Um, and uh, this is sort of a context of, of lunar water mining. Um, but um, there's a number of problems with that. Um, well, the first of all, um, all development of spacecrafts is already quite complex. Um, but when we top on to that, the, the, the mining and habitation infrastructure, um, we have to address a lot of different knowledge gaps that we still have to fill, um, develop new technologies and connect them in, in a way that makes a base, like a lunar base, uh, sustainable. Um, and each of the problem areas in moon base development has a plethora of their own knowledge gaps that needs to be filled. And here I'm just showing the problem areas of just water ice extraction and propellant production. Um, and one thing to know is that in processes like that, uh, uncertainties propagate along the process. So we really need to figure out all of those problems to gain confidence in the whole systems. Um, and uh, the problems that I'm focusing on in my research is this core problem of the understanding of icy regolith, how heat and mass transfers in porous space under vacuum in uh, low temperatures, and also how efficiently can we extra extract uh, the water vapor from, from icy regolith with systems like you see in the background, so the thermal mining system. Um, 
but to do that, we um, um, we need a lot of work uh, and um, uh, laboratory investigations are always a good idea, a good start for that. Um, we need to simulate the extreme environments like hard vacuum, low temperatures. We can't really simulate uh, low gravity uh, on long time frames, but uh, we also need analogous materials. We, we already heard about regolith and, and how we can make analogs on, on Earth. So that's what we do. Um, and we do that to, to validate certain hypotheses or, or, or models. Um, and uh, there's there's not a lot of places in the world uh, that allow you to do dirty experiments. And with space resources, we are talking mainly about them. Um, you need a dirty thermal vacuum chamber that, uh, that are more costly to maintain. Um, you need regular simulants and, and different instruments to record data. Um, and here you can see how a typical sample looked like uh, in my experiments. Uh, and in the video here, how, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> how things get dirty pretty fast um, in such experiments. Uh, this was actually uh, unintended over here, uh, but it happens. Uh, that was about water vapor excavating a layer of, of dust. Um, but anyway, you do experiments to then validate those models and uh, you need to combine multiple physics to do that. Um, and you also need to take into account a uh, significant variability in material properties of dry regolith, uh, ice and, and, and their mixtures uh, uh, and properties like thermal conductivity um, and heat capacity, permeability are strongly dependent on what's happening during the process, um, um, but also on other factors like particle size distribution, particle shape distribution of regolith uh, and ices. And because of that, it, it is really hard to see two samples, um, both in lab and especially on the moon, um, that will have uh, the same properties. Um, and my research, focuses on um, the sublimation front and its behavior. And sublimation front is a, is a boundary uh, between a desiccated regolith and an icy regolith. So it basically shows you how far did you uh, effectively excavate the deposit. Um, and um, even though I got rough correlations between the model and experiments, um, one thing is certain, uh, the front is moving very slowly in those conditions, so under vacuum, uh, and, and under uh, initial low temperatures. Um, and it is also a um, highly energy intensive process. Um, I also scaled up the model uh, to reflect the, the thermal mining architecture. So instead of centimeters, we are now looking at meters. Instead of hours, we are looking at days. Um, and because of that, we can finally get an insight about um, thermal mining performance in the conditions of permanently shadowed regions. Of course, it's not perfectly um, defined, it's not perfectly simulated, but it still provides us very rough um, answers to, 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 to many problems that we, uh, that we currently face. And again, um, the main focus of this research is to show the behavior of the summation front and uh, again, we can extract it from combined uh, heat and mass transfers. Mm. And uh, one of the most important findings in my research is this distinction of those five production phases based on changes in interface velocity and acceleration interface, so the sublimation front. Um, so we have a global maximum of production uh, during initial production then a large decline to local minimum, um, then another increase to a local maximum, and then a decline that um, eventually leads to, to, to virtually zero production. Um, and we have those decline curves that follow parallel decline, uh, while the total production has an asymptotic limit, all of which um, is mainly due to the fact that there is a sublimation like buildup. So just a couple of centimeters of desiccated regolith is enough to stop production because the lag has very poor thermal conductivity, uh, very poor uh, thermal properties and acts as a 
um, thermal insulator. Um, but um, having a petroleum engineering background uh, really helped in analysis of all of that uh, because I actually wrote a bachelor's thesis while I was there at the HEH, drilling oil and gas faculty. Uh, and the thesis was on the decline curve analysis in tight gas production. So we have a very similar production behavior in oil and gas um, on Earth, like in lunar water, or probably in lunar water on the moon. Um, and this is very important because that not only shows us how to, uh, that we can use validated models for resource estimation, for production forecasts, but it also allows us to draw a conclusion that uh, bulk thermal conductivity is the main production factor on the moon, and it's probably identical to reservoir pressure on Earth. And um, because of the sublimation lag, we can't reach the thermal mining targets that are roughly 10 tons of water per 44 hour extraction and 5% IC deposit. We do get similar production rates at the very beginning of the process, but um, the sublimation lag uh, damps production pretty quickly. Um, and uh, um, so we need to use some systemic approaches to mitigate that. Um, we can remove the lag by, by mechanical means or pneumatic excavation, um, or we can use extraction system. We can move it um, every 16 hours instead of 44 hours. Uh, so we, we need uh, some changes to CONOPS. But um, one thing is still certain, uh, I mean, maybe we, we can't reach those 10 tons. Uh, we're reaching about 30% of that, 40% of that. Uh, but it's still a lot of water that we can use on the moon. Uh, and that is, that is very, very important. Um, so yeah, that, that was just in a nutshell. Uh, I strongly recommend you to read my recent papers and references within to get a broader picture about the subject. Uh, there's not a lot of literature about water mining beyond Earth. So for now, um, you have to res resolve to, to, to this work, but, but hopefully more researchers will follow and we'll have more results to compare with. Um, but also um, tens of missions are now being developed for lunar exploration, especially for water prospecting and maybe even tech demos for, for extraction. So in the upcoming years, we will have um, a lot to analyze, so that's good. And with that, thank you so much for your attention.